when we look at so much of that knowledge, it wasn't lost, but it was taken very intentionally from us. And that's something that we've seen, you know, with near eradication of bison from the prairies, we see that our diets rapidly transitioned. We became dependent on all these subsidized food systems and our communities, our nations, we're no longer able to feed ourselves. The Urban Exodus podcast shares the wisdom, wit, and stories of those who decided to embark on the road less traveled to pursue their own interpretation of the good life. Small business owners, change makers, artists, farmers, and more working towards building a better future for themselves and their fellow citizens. The people I've met through this project give me energy and hope for a better future. May their inspirational words and practical advice embolden and guide you on your own journey. This podcast is for country dreamers, rural folk, and urban dwellers alike who want to feel more connected to the natural world and the purpose and choices in their lives. I'm Melissa Hessler. Welcome to the Urban Exodus. Urban Exodus is a labor of love and is only made possible by listener support. To support our programming, please consider making a listener contribution or joining our Patreon community for access to bonus features, rapid fire interviews, videos, and so much more. I'm excited to invite you to my conversation with Mariah Gladstone. Mariah is a member of the Blackfeet and Cherokee Nations. She is a self-trained chef and food sovereignty activist from Northwest Montana. She is also the creator and host of Indigi Kitchen, an online platform and cooking show dedicated to re-indigenizing our diets using traditional native foods. After graduating from Columbia University with a degree in environmental engineering, Mariah returned home to her ancestral lands on the Blackfeet Reservation. She worked several corporate and government jobs before deciding to start Indigi Kitchen. She completed her master's degree at SUNY Syracuse through the Center for Native Peoples in the Environment. She was an MIT Indigenous Communities Fellow. She was recognized as a champion for change through the Center of Native American Youth, a culture of health leader through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and she has given a TED Talk on healing trauma through traditional foodways. Mariah is a global activist on the issue of food sovereignty and still somehow finds enough time to hunt, fish, grow, and provide for herself through the land. In our conversation, we speak about her work as an advocate for her community, how she built in DigiKitchen with no prior media experience, moving from engineering into activism, her food and self-sufficiency practices on her homestead, and what it means for us to truly re-indigenize our diets. This is a story about reconnecting with cultural and ancestral wisdom, using art and food as a catalyst for positive change, and the importance of building strong local communities. So I am absolutely thrilled today to have on the podcast Mariah Gladstone and Mariah, I forget where I first heard you speak, but I remember either on a podcast or as your TED Talk, and I saw you speak and I just like, I got goosebumps. And you were just saying so many things that I think that a lot of people don't talk about but need to be said. And you're also just an inspiration in the knowledge that you are researching and sharing and like keeping alive. First off, I would love if you could start at the beginning. Could you share a little bit of your personal backstory, where you grew up, and the paths you've taken that have led you to where you are now? Yeah, it's great to be here today. I was born and raised in the northwest corner of Montana on either side of what we Blackfeet called the backbone of the world. So I grew up both on and off the reservation going to school on the west side of the mountains, spending summers on the east side of the mountains. And then after high school, I graduated and went to New York City. I studied environmental engineering at Columbia. And I came home after graduation and worked a couple of corporate jobs and realized that 
my passions really lied in food sovereignty and wanting to make a difference in my home community, in indigenous communities across Turtle Island. And I started Indigi Kitchen. So I work on the revitalization of traditional indigenous foods. And along the way, I decided to go to grad school. I got a funded opportunity in Syracuse to study at SUNY ESF with a phenomenal native advisor. So again, I went back to New York and went to school and COVID hit in the middle of that. So I actually bought a house back on the reservation and moved back home to my especially rural community on the res, even for our res, where I finished my graduate program and I continue to work on a digit kitchen from here. So you moved from your small community in Montana to attend Columbia in New York City, and then you went back for your graduate degree. What was that transition like for you moving from a more remote area into this bustling city metropolis? You know, I was used to a community where I, you know, measured distance and hours (laughs) and then suddenly finding myself in New York City where there are so many things, but my way of accessing them was so much more complicated than I had had it in my rural community. I remember trying to finish a sewing project and I didn't realize that instead of just going to a Walmart, for example, there was an entire district and that was the only place you could buy fabric in the city. And I had no car. So it was always like, how do I plot my way out on MapQuest? Because I, I was like, I had a flip phone. So I would either have to like plot my route out beforehand, figure out which subways I needed to take. I remember calling my mom on my flip phone and asking her to pull up the maps on her computer to figure out where I was. And so I I had to obviously navigate a lot of different changing systems, but also, you know, especially as it is in this lens of food and indigenous foodways, New York City is this place of incredibly diverse cuisine where supposedly there are foods from, from everywhere. And I found myself missing a lot of the foods that I'd grown up with. I couldn't find bison meat for example, except for maybe a restaurant that would sell a bison burger. For like 60 bucks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I couldn't find, I flew home for a break and I was like, I'm just missing wild game meat so much. And so in my carry-on bag, I had packed frozen packages of moose meat and deer meat. And I remember I'm taking this in my carry-on. I will wrap it in clothes for insulation. It will make it for the two plane rides because if they lose my luggage, I do not want rotting meat in my luggage. (laughs) (laughs) And so TSA was like, what is this? I'm like, it's a solid, it's fine. (laughs) Um, And I brought brought wild game meat back to New York City with me because it was just a food that I missed so much. Absolutely. And I mean, if you're raised on one type of meat, like wild meat tastes totally different than raised meat. It just really does. It has a completely different taste. And I would imagine that you could feel very homesick for that. So after school, so you went to New York City for your undergrad, and then you went back for graduate school. Maybe COVID forced the issue to a certain degree. Was that kind of the case? But you decided to move back to Montana. And I wondered what guided your decision to leave the city and what that transition was like then going back home. My graduate experience was a bit different from my undergrad because I was in Syracuse. So I was in a community that more closely resembled where I had grown up in terms of at least having my own space and my own vehicle and things like that. But I had actually already planned to return home midway through my graduate studies. I completed my coursework so that I would be able to move back to the reservation and then just finish my thesis from home. So I had that already planned out. I closed on my house in February of 2020 And I had planned on moving back at the end of the semester and COVID hit, which meant that my partner and I got to move back immediately. (laughs) I realized also that because I still had the semester to finish, I had to navigate this issue of rural internet access, uh, which is especially bad in reservation communities. 
satellite exists, but is expensive and has contracts and is still super slow and data limited. And we have, I think we have internet available through the phone lines, through copper phone lines that are less than one megabyte per second in speed. So we instead had a Verizon MiFi and we would do all of our Zooms from our phones so that we wouldn't eat up data. And I think it was actually, we had to wait until November of 2021 before we finally had Starlink offered. And now I have high-speed internet. So it's the magic of connectivity within this rural space. So it makes working from home especially easy, but for the end of the semester, it was doing all my classes on little Zoom meetings on my phone. And because I teach cooking classes, it's all been from my phone and, you know, figuring out that just in terms of how to navigate data limitations and signal boosters and everything else that goes along with that. Absolutely. And I mean, you built Indigikitchen from a rural area, which I'm based in a rural area in Maine. And it's so incredibly difficult to build something from scratch in a rural area because you have oftentimes obstacles that people wouldn't really consider. And I wondered if beyond the internet, what other obstacles and maybe even benefits that you feel like are gained from building Indigikitchen where you are now? You know, it's great because when I first conceptualized in DigiKitchen in 2016, I was already thinking, of course, as a millennial, use the tools that come second nature to me, social media and technology, and to think about the ways in which we can use those tools to magnify and disseminate ancestral wisdom. And so you know, Indigikitchen is Indigenous Digital Kitchen. It has always integrated this digital realm. And so fortunately, by the time I moved back home from graduate school, it was already part of the way that I had envisioned things to have this sphere in the digital realm. And so even though my cooking classes were taught in person and I did a lot of in-person engagements before COVID, It definitely made it easier to make that transition to solely digital with the start of the pandemic. And so I was fortunate. I would joke around and say that we were in the business of distance learning before it was cool because we were already putting out videos and material and content for people in this space. And that's something that I recognize, you know, even in older generations of native people, we have incredibly high rates of Facebook usage because it makes it easy for people to stay connected. And that is really helpful and has helped me be able to expand in DigiKitchen and really navigate changing times. So I would say that there are definitely challenges of being in a rural space, but some of the ways in which I was already doing business in this rural space actually has eased the transition too. And just to be able to be kind of on the forefront where everybody else was having to like kind of learn or move very quickly (laughs) into that digital realm, you kind of already had all the tools and you were like, okay, I have more of a kind of captive audience now because people are actually looking for that connection, that wisdom, that knowledge, and we have time all of a sudden to focus. You moved back to Montana and you're in a very remote environment. Your closest grocery store is 35 miles away. And I'm wondering what you do now, what your response has been to having that grocery store so far away on your homestead, because I know that you grow, hunt, fish, a lot of your food. So I'd love for you to kind of talk about where you live and how you have kind of navigated having supplies so far away, traditionally like grocery store supplies. Yeah, it's interesting because I grew up spending my summers here in this community, though, of course, in the summers, our population swells exponentially because we are right next to Glacier National Park. So our winters are freezing with big snows and regular 110 mile an hour winds. And even that road between our house and the grocery store 
will get drifted over and will occasionally close, which it has this year. It has for almost a month at a time before in previous years. So there's another route into town, though it is a little bit longer. And then also, you know, we have another community that is about 25 miles to the north, but that's in Canada. So it is a closer place to go shopping, but you can't get across the border easily now. So in the past, that's where I would run and I would go to the hardware store and the grocery store up there and just use my tribal ID to get across the border. And now because of testing requirements, there's no way to do that easily. So it's interesting because it's this realm that has made our supply chain especially tricky to navigate. But of course, there is also, because I grew up in this space, I kind of understand some of that pre-planning that's required. So, you know, there's there's a larger community about two and a half hours away from us. And so we'll go into Costco and make big Costco runs. And so one of the first things we did when we moved in was get a big chest freezer. <laughs> and so we have that ability to, you know, stock up with a lot of wild game meat. I think my partner has it packed with a lot of hides that he's waiting to tan. <laughs> Um, and so right now that's what's in there, but we live on a lake with amazing rainbow trout fishing. And so, you know, we made sure that we got a smoker so we can have lots of smoked fish and we can add that to the foods that we're able to get from the land. Our house is actually right next to the hunter staging area for the reservation, one of the hunter staging areas. And so we have access to deer and elk hunting here which we're super lucky to have moose if we get a tag from the res, if we're in that lottery and get it. And then of course, there's a lot of family nearby as well. And so, you know, what one person isn't able to get, uh, we end up helping each other out and swapping and our, our house became the meat shed for hanging <laughs> animals. So that's, we're super lucky to have that. And then, you know, we're right next to the mountains we're about 5,500 feet in elevation. And I already mentioned our big winds and snows, but our, our frost-free days average about 90, I'd want to say. Last summer was especially warm and we had June 1st to September 1st. And that was a lot of 95 degree days in the middle there, but it's a, it's a short growing season. And so we work on starting plants inside, use a lot of season extenders, our little poly tunnels. And we have a greenhouse that's waiting to get set up when the ground Ooh, thaws out. That's my dream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and that's, that's more of a, a bigger greenhouse. And of course we also had to figure out how do we ensure that our greenhouse will stay up in the winds. And so we made sure that when we ordered the pieces for it, we ordered a really reinforced plastic. Also because despite our temperatures, we're on an area that is pretty sunny. And so we also want to make sure that our plants can breathe in the summertime as well. And then we, we work on planting cool season crops and greens and things like that. But we were able to successfully grow tomatoes and peppers and squash in our little growing season, in part by starting things inside. I got corn this year and I used my painted mountain corn, which is designed for Montana weather. So navigate a lot of that. We grew a lot of huckleberry gold potatoes, which is actually a low glycemic potato that was developed by Montana State Agricultural Extension Agency. And so it's a low glycemic potato, but it's grown for Montana climates as well. You talked a little bit about the sense of community that you have there and how your community really looks out for one another and takes care of each other. And I wonder what community means to you on your reservation, but also like the community that you've built with Kitchen. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, my reservation probably has about a population of 12,000 people. That's a land area, about a million and a half acres. So a little bit larger than the state of Delaware. And, you know, in that area, we live in this little corner called Bab. Our town is 75% Bs <laughs> and 25% As. You only need the first two letters for it. And the year-round population is probably around 300 here. 
And that's pretty spread out, not all concentrated in one, one town. But really excitedly, <laughs> we have a grocery store now that it's it's small. It's right next to a little restaurant, but it's a place that we're able to go get eggs and milk and baking supplies and things like that, which is really cool. But it's amazing that this little corner of the reservation that is, you know, 30 miles from population centers is so community oriented in a way that is also emblematic of our independence as a community. And I, I mean different things by that, but I think of stories like we really wanted to do something for the kids in the community this year. We have a little, I think it's a K through eight school, and we really wanted to do something to give that kind of holiday cheer <laughs> for Christmas. And, and we don't have like a, a formal like parade or anything like that. And so the community came together and decided we were just going to organize a parade in our community of 300. <laughs> and so we planned a route. There was a local family that had a barn. So they put up Christmas lights all over the barn. I think Nicolas Cage was there earlier in the year filming. So they had the inside of it set up with trees for something with the movie. So we just decorated the trees and then we organized a cookie exchange. So if you bring cookies, other people can get cookies. And then we're basically like, we're going to decorate our cars with lights. People have decorated flatbeds. They had like inflatable, like blow up animals. And someone had like a baby Yoda in Christmas gear on their per And I, my brother was in town for this because he was home from, for holidays. And he was laughing. He's like, is everybody going to be in the parade? Is there anybody going to be watching the parade <laughs> or is everybody going to be in the parade? And I remember when we woke up for this parade, the temperature for the day, the high for the day was two degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, everyone's like, we're still doing this. This is fine. I remember we personally had like decked out my partner's square body pickup and dressed up my brother and his girlfriend like elves. I sewed little hats for our dogs. And then I have a pole stage for aerials. And so we put up a pole and like wrapped it and we're like, it's the North Pole. And it's just, it was this incredible community event. And I remember we had toys that were donated from Toys for Tots. And so all these kids got overwhelmed with toys because there weren't that many kids in the community. And so then they got them at school. We dropped the rest of them off at school. We had all these little snack bags that later got delivered to the school. And it was really cool because there's not even that type of activity within the larger communities on the reservation. It's so beautiful because even just looking at the way that tight communities function. You know, it's where you take care of one another, where you're looking out for people, where you're sharing resources. So everybody doesn't have to have like all of the tools, all of the things that they need. That's just, it's so much more sustainable too. And it makes you more resilient as a community as well. Going back to the second part of that question, what does it mean to you now to have a community beyond the community that you live within and to be an advocate for your people and also an inspiration to people all over the world who are finding your content and learning from it and making positive changes in their lives because of it. Yeah, it's really amazing to see the community that exists because of this food sovereignty movement, this desire to rebuild and reimagine indigenous food systems. And so a project that I've been working on recently has been actually collecting recipes from around Turtle Island, around indigenous people that want to share recipes. And my original plan was actually to be able to travel and visit people in their home communities, film them preparing a recipe and to make a video for them that they can share with their community from that. Of course, COVID happened and the desire to protect our elders and knowledge keepers and folks is so strong. And that was transitioned to Zoom recordings and interviews. And so it's amazing to see the recipes that people are interested in sharing and what they want to be able to 
make Googleable information for their community members. You know, native people want to be able to look up our recipes online too. We want to know how to prepare our traditional foods. We want to know more about the plants that grow in our area. And when we look at so much of that knowledge, it wasn't lost, but it was taken very intentionally from us. Yeah, it was um, cultural erasure. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's something that we've seen, you know, with the eradication of or near eradication of bison from the prairies, we see that our diets rapidly transitioned. We became dependent on all these subsidized food systems and our communities, our nations, we're no longer able to feed ourselves. And that's something we're working really hard to get back. So that's something that it's cool to see the people that have knowledge sharing it. And I've received folks sharing recipes using acorn flour, using buffalo tongue. Um, I got a cool buffalo tongue stew recipe. Actually, there's a, a really beautiful recipe that I was sh shared from a woman of Peruvian ancestry and actually making a tea from this purple corn. And instead of making like a food, it's actually flavoring a drink. So there's really, really cool stories and recipes and people are eager to share them. They want folks to know about the delicious amazing diversity of their traditional foods or their modern foods with traditional ingredients and to be able to share that and help recognize that contribution of wisdom. So I love seeing that. I think it's amazing. And it's also really cool to see how folks interact in social media platforms with the material that's being put out because I see people tagging their family members and their friends and they're saying, let's make this this weekend. Grandma, I think you have some of this. Can, can you make some with me? And it's really cool because of that interaction of family. We know that food is so community-based and having a resource that makes people want to cook something new is really, really cool to me. I, I don't spend a lot of time telling people what not to eat, right? That's not really motivating. People want to eat healthy. They want to feed their family good food. They just need more tools. And so that's what we work on doing. Last night, actually, I got to help with the nutrition class for our local food pantry. And so it was using a recipe from Indigi Kitchen. So I got to do the demonstration for it. And it was the bison and butternut squash lasagna recipe. And so Everyone picked up a bag that had a butternut squash. We had bison meat that was from a local ranch here. And they had an onion and they had their little spices pre-mixed and a can of tomato sauce. And then we all went through this together. So even though we're learning on Zoom, we're all in the Blackfeet community and we're all cooking together. So we're all smelling the same things. We're all struggling to cut our little lasagna noodles together out of the butternut squash and at the end, everyone's holding up their lasagna and it's 630. So their families are like gathering around them. There's a little kid in the camera munching on some of the raw squash. This noodle is delicious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it was really, really cool. And then the dietitian that had organized this had them fill out a survey at the end. And it, I almost started crying reading the responses to the survey. Just like, what did you like about this class? What can we approve? And they're like, this is so great to hear about history, to hear about Blackfeet plants, to learn about more healthy foods I can feed my family. I remember at the beginning, people were talking, they're like, I'm diabetic. I need to learn how to cook better. I've had a stroke. I'm All these people sharing their stories and why they were interested in this class. And it was really, really cool to be able to eat something that we've eaten for so long on these lands, but to be able to share that in this new way where everybody's family has recognized it as food and they all got to, to cook together, which was really fun. Everyone has lost their connection to food in some ways, but to be able to kind of all learn together and to understand the importance and appreciate the ingredients going together, that's, I mean, it's, it's so much easier. I never cooked before I left the city. I didn't have I didn't have a reason to per se. And then coming back and learning how to cook again and appreciating the ingredients that went into it. And like, it just, it changed the whole thing of eating for me. And I think that it's such a gift to be able to share that 
with your community and to see it all in real time too, to see the, the kids getting involved. Yeah, that's just magic. Indigenous Kitchen is really a fusion of art, activism, and food. And I think artists often find ways to create palatable methods to serve the difficult truths. And I really appreciate how you incorporate historical, environmental, and ecological knowledge into your recipes. And I'd love to learn more about how you research and prepare for every episode. It ranges based on what I'm doing and, and what I'm working with. So I admit that as a small child, my mom let me experiment a lot in the kitchen. And so I still do that. <laughs> I will wake up and I'll be like, what if I made thumbprint cookies with blue cornmeal and filled them with choke cherry jam? I think that could work. How do I make that work? And I'll start throwing things together and I'll film it because I'm like, well, if I do this, I just want to get the footage right away. And sometimes it won't work out and I'll just have unused footage stashed in some corner of my hard drive. You should release that someday, like all of the recipes that do work. Yeah, yeah. I think what holds me up is I'm like, uh, the editing. The editing will just take too long for something that tastes like trash. Understand. I understand. <laughs> um, but I definitely have footage of, for example, making maple sugar. And I had to transfer the maple sugar once it reached temperature off of the burner, which means I had to reposition my camera. And the trick, because I was doing this all myself, was move, reposition the camera. Oh no, the camera's too heavy. I have to like fix it. And then the maple sugar is like boiling over over here. <laughs> so I have it badly on camera. And of course, when I edited that video, you would never be able to tell that I had maple sugar, <laughs> hot napalm sugar melting all over the countertop that gets edited out. <laughs> uh, but it is fun because I get to, I get to look up foods and recipes and Sometimes I'm reaching out and I'm asking folks that know way more about ingredients than I do. So for example, there's a lot of tribes that have used wood ashes as both a cooking method, like nishtamalization, treating corn so that it's more digestible, as well as a seasoning. So I'm reaching out to people and I'm like, okay, what wood ashes would taste good with, you know, do I use elm ashes or pecan ashes or, you know, trying to ask these different questions how many teaspoons of wood ashes do I add to a gallon of water to raise the pH to nine or whatever? I don't know. I'm trying to think of these questions because I'm approaching this from both a scientific perspective, which is more my academic background and this culinary chaos perspective <laughs> and trying to figure out all of those things. That said, I will also use academic texts and ethnographies to research things. It was actually from an old writing that someone had made in the late 1800s that told me that Blackfeet people would put the sticks from choke cherry plants into a roast while it was cooking to flavor it. And of course that makes sense. It's a fruit wood and that's what you do with cloves and a ham, right? And so I'm like, oh yeah, that the wood would infuse that with a flavor, much like cooking on a cedar plank, much like using wood chips and smoking. And so I was like, oh, I would have never thought of that on my own, but now I want to try it with our service berry wood as well, which is our other fruit wood here. I want to make smoking chips like for smoking our trout out of choke cherry wood chips. So I'm thinking of like all of these cool ideas that come from that. And then I experiment a lot. Right now, it's really fun because I'm working off of other people's recipes. And I'm like, oh, I just get to do exactly what you're telling me to do. And that's what it is. I have the recording of you telling me to do this. And I can just do the work in my anonymous film format, which is kind of freeing in a sense. I don't have to think quite as much about troubleshooting the recipes. But I'm also really fortunate that I... I got to work with the Rocky Boy Food Sovereignty Program, for example, and they asked me to make a value-added product from some of the products that they were growing on the reservation. And so they basically handed me a whole bunch of kamut flour, which is an ancient grain, hemp seeds, some raw honey, safflower oil, and june berries or service berries. 
And they're like, what can you make with all of these, but like not really any other additions? And I'm like, huh, this is fun. (laughs) So we have a taste test set up in about a month, probably, where we get to take the different things that I've made with these ingredients and decide which one the tribe wants to actually package and sell. Wow, that's so much fun. That's so creative. It's so multi-layered too. You're able to kind of dive into so many things that you're interested in and kind of pull them all together. But I would imagine that that is really challenging. My final recipe definitely had an egg in it. And I'm like, you guys can source local eggs. But it's, I think, I think the one that they're going to pick is what I'm saying. Because I, I made some really delicious, lovely breakfast bars that are, of course, sweetened with the, the raw honey. And they have the June berries in them. But it's that nice kamut flour. And so it's a good little prepackaged kind of protein thing to get on the road. So I like it, but I also made them fruit leather. (laughs) I made them a couple different things. We'll see which one they really love, but I thought it was cool to be able to take those because they want to grow things, but they also recognize that there's that extra step of processing that gets our food from the rural communities where it's grown to where we buy it and the formats we buy it in. And so they built a commercial kitchen just so they would be able to take some of their products right from the field to their community without having to, without it having to leave the reservation. I just wanted to give an enormous thank you to all of the listeners who have made contributions towards the production of this podcast. Every season, I spend about 100 hours preparing, writing, editing, interviewing, sketching, distributing, and I have hard costs for my editor and hosting fees. It means so much to me that you find enough value and meaning in this work to pledge your support to keep it going. If you haven't had a chance to contribute, we've made it really easy. Just click the support button on the top of urbanexodus.com and pledge any amount that you like. Or join the Urban Exodus Patreon community. Thank you again. I feel so lucky to be a part of the amazing global community that this project has manifested. I feel like there are probably a lot of people like you who may not come to the table with a media background, but they have something really important to say. What advice would you give them on how to get started, how to build that confidence, and how to stay the course through the inevitable roadblocks that will be put in their way? I think it's so much easier for people to get involved in digital media making now than it was even when I started. Obviously, TikTok, Instagram, Reels are all really popular formats for people. And we all have incredible video editing software on our phones now, which makes it really easy for people to be able to share recipes and stories and community projects right from their fingertips um, to be able to build, edit, and upload everything from one device, which is really cool. That said, there's also a lot of tutorials on YouTube that detail how to set things up, that detail different different materials that folks need. So a big game changer in my own work was just getting a ring light set up because I needed to make sure that I didn't have weird shadows going over my food at all times, which is definitely what happened in the early days of Indigi Kitchen. And my phenomenal cousin who is starring alongside Leonardo DiCaprio in the new movie, Killers of the Flower Moon. <laughs> she's, she's, she works in film. She knows things. Lily wrote to me and she's like, you need to get a lighting set up. And I was like, oh, lighting. <laughs> and so I, I figured that out and I was like, oh, it looks so much better right now. And now when I do cooking demonstrations from home, I get to have my phone in a ring light and everything is well lit even at nighttime or with different conditions. I'm like, that's huge. (laughs) And then, you know, figuring out a good video editing software for me, because I wanted to be able to, you know, when I started, (laughs) TikTok was not the format to do things with. I still haven't taken the time to learn TikTok, admittedly, but I, I do have, you know, Adobe Premiere Pro. So I can put things in video editing software. And now as I'm filming these interviews and I'm stitching that together, with the videos of food being made. I'm really happy that I have that background in a really technical 
video editing software that I'm able to use and to translate longer form videos. Um, my partner is going to be teaching a hide processing class and we're going to be filming the whole thing so that we can also make that available as a digital resource too. And that's, that's going to require that longer form setup and tutorial. And then it can go onto YouTube and become part of the digital library as well. You are an absolutely gifted presenter and speaker. And I wondered if this is something that you've been good at your entire life, or was it something that you had to work at? I grew up as the child of a performing artist. <laughs> and so a lot of my childhood was spent on road trips to concerts. And I learned to, if not be comfortable in front of people, because I would say that I was a very shy child, I learned how to talk to people. And I would often find myself listening to adult conversations rather than finding other children my age to play with. And then my dad inevitably would drag me up on stage and make me do some stupid human trick or something. And so I learned to be comfortable in that format. I also, I think, was shaped by a lot of speech and debate, go policy debate. <laughs> <laughs> and, and because because I went to a high school that took that super seriously and emphasized that community and that that competitive spirit. And so that is where I learned, I think, to be able to share my ideas, but in ways that were explained logically. I learned that you can approach subjects from other subjects <laughs> and make them more accessible to people. So for my work, that means that I use food as a vehicle to talk about colonization and the need to take care of our landscapes. You know, when we take care of our food and where our food comes from, then we know that we're also going to take care of the soil and the air and the water because we depend on those things too. And all of that, you know, is wrapped into this package of food systems. And we get to talk about delicious recipes and healthy eating and sharing space with our family. But it is done with a vehicle that allows it to also talk about history and the reason why we have to revitalize indigenous foods and all of the work to destroy indigenous food systems that's gotten us to this place we're at now. So I think that, you know, a lot of that makes people really excited and makes them approach subjects that they would generally shy away from. So now I'm giving away all my sneak attack secrets, but. Uh. <laughs> it is all about the packaging and the method of delivery, right? To get the message out there. And I think that I'm, well, I don't think that I know history in the United States is so whitewashed and paints a picture that's totally inaccurate and not true. And it continues to uphold white supremacy. And so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the colonization of food. Yeah, there has been a lot of documentation about the ways that colonial governments, including the United States and Canada, have worked to control indigenous food systems to control indigenous people. So that, of course, started in the very early days of the United States with Washington's orders against the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and burning their crops, their storehouses of crops, and their gardens so that they would not be able to plant again. It was the idea that controlling people's food would prevent them from rising up against militarily, against colonization. And that continued across the plains. There was written in the 1850 Commissioner of Indian Affairs report, it is cheaper in the end to feed the whole flock for a year than to fight them for a week. Essentially advocating that forcing Native people onto subsidized food systems would prevent them from pushing back with military force. And it happened in different ways. You know, there were rivers that were dammed that stopped fish from coming upstream. In addition to, I think of the Colorado River, which stopped the irrigation that tribes downstream were able to practice. And people 
in many, many places were in fact forced into rations and subsidized food systems. And that's where we get foods like fry bread. And then later we get the commodity food program, which still exists in our communities. And there are foods that we have our commodity cheese blocks and our potted meat, our canned meats and things like that, that has even become part of our identities in a way. And so after generations, and then of course you look at our reservation communities being squeezed smaller and smaller, and then with the Dawes Act partitioned into individual parcels, there was this belief through the Dawes Act and, you know, of course the Homestead Act that came with that, that you should be able to feed yourself off of these 160 acres (laughs) and you can farm or you can ranch. And those are the only morally okay things. There is no hunting and gathering. That is for vagrant tramps, I think was Senator Dawes's quote, because our, our hunting and gathering was considered lazy, despite the fact that we were able to feed ourselves and nothing lazy about and, it. <laughs> yeah, and not deplete the soils and, and, and have really sustainable food systems. I also, I look at the traditional games that were played by Indigenous peoples across the continent. You look to the Northeast and you see lacrosse. You look to the Plains and out here we have, it's actually a women's game. It's called double ball. And it's, I guess, similar to lacrosse in a sense, but you have two goalposts on either end of a field, which could be a half mile long. And you play with actually just sticks and the ball is actually a weighted, it has it's a double ball. You have weights on either side with a leather strip. And so you can hold it on a stick and it's a women's game and you play catch and you get the crap beat out of you with sticks and hip checks and everything. And it's what women would play where the men were out hunting. And I think of these traditional games, which were for fun and, you know, were for, you know, were war games in some cases, but they were a huge expansion of calories for no no return other than fun and fitness and occasionally dispute settlements. But just to have a game or a societies that were so rich in games meant that we had this downtime. We had times that we were able to just burn calories for the heck of it. And that meant a food surplus. Those things in our cultures pointed to the success of our food systems. And so I look at that and I look at all these traditional games that are still practiced and played and that became so central to our cultures and our ways of being. And it's stuff like that, that I'm like hunter gatherer societies and even our indigenous farming societies were, had the resources to be able to do that and chill out and play games. <laughs> um, and I, I think of that stuff as, you know, where we have come from now, where, you know, people have to work so hard just to be able to afford food and shelter and to be at that point and trying to think of regaining food sovereignty. Food sovereignty is a big, complicated definition, lots of, lots of legs to that chair, but essentially food sovereignty means the right of people to healthy, number one, (laughs) culturally appropriate, number two, affordable, number three, foods harvested through ecologically sound and sustainable methods, number four, and the right to define and govern those food systems, number five. So this idea that everyone in our community should be able to afford healthy food that is culturally appropriate is definitely something that I think that we've gotten away from in Western society. If the poorest people in our community can't afford to eat healthy, we don't have food sovereignty. If people are being fed preserved crap, then that's not food sovereignty. And we also want to make sure that things are culturally appropriate. So things can be healthy and affordable and be made entirely out of bugs which in some cases works, but some people don't recognize those as foods. So they don't meet that definition. And then of course, the right to harvest those things with ecologically sound and sustainable methods, whatever methods we're using to get food, we want to make sure 
that we are ensuring the health of our ecosystems and our land and our water, and we're not poisoning any of those pieces or depleting nutrients in order to get our food today. And then, of course, you know, as sovereign nations, we also look at the right to write our own food and agricultural codes, to examine food safety, to write codes that govern food safety, to regulate those things so that we can ensure the quality of our food systems. So those are all the things that I think about. But I recognize that, you know, access is, of course, a huge part of food sovereignty, but we also need people to be excited about it. And we need people to know how to cook with those foods that we're working on regaining access to. Absolutely. The multiple parts of that are so integral to it because being able to protect water quality and access to water to be able to grow crops, cultivate crops is so important. And just like the overall healthy ecosystem is so important in order for us to sustain our food systems and to get it back to a place where we're thriving instead of killing everything off. I strongly believe that the only way to survive, mitigate, and navigate through our current climate catastrophe is to turn to indigenous knowledge and leadership. And I know that you are passionate about ecology and protecting the environment. And you also received your master's degree from the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. And so I'd love for you to share any vision that you have for a future that works towards healing our relationship with the natural world. Yeah, I think there's so much knowledge and wisdom within this realm that we've categorized as traditional ecological knowledge, TEK. And there's still been a very little of it that has actually been peer reviewed and tested in this Western scientific space. And that's, that's everything from medicines to harvesting methods, to planting methods, to knowing when fish are going to be in an area or whatever it may be. And so I think that there is a lot of work that will be done and will continue to be recognized in those spaces. I look now to California and recognizing the wisdom of fire management and the ways in which Native people in California have managed fires by setting fires and being able to not look at trees, for example, as a commodity, but to be able to look at our ecosystems as multiple components and us living amongst the ecosystems. I I see a lot of Western literature still painting wilderness as this area that is external to humans. But rather, I think of the thousands of years of land management and ways in which Indigenous people have managed those wilderness spaces and them not as wild and untouched, but rather as places that have been cultivated and planted and maintained. And rather to look at that because those lie, those hold a lot of the keys of that ecological knowledge. And then also when you learn pieces of indigenous knowledge to not get caught up on that one thing, but rather to keep looking bigger and bigger and all of those connections that occur. I think that people will learn one piece of indigenous knowledge and they'll go like, yeah, that's a thing. And then, and then they'll keep citing that and they won't recognize all the other things that are connected to it. And to keep zooming out a little bit on that because we're talking about ecosystems and food systems and everything is connected. And we want to make sure that our role in that system plays a, has a positive impact on biodiversity and land health and water health and all of those pieces. I think that there is this real feeling that people are feeling now, especially even after the pandemic, seeing how susceptible we are to supply chain demands and this feeling of, oh, I can't take care of my basic human needs anymore. And I wondered, are you hopeful for the future that we can mend these systems we have to mend these systems. There's not really an option because the alternative is is 
continued concentration of our food systems and eventual collapse. We've recognized, and I think that has been a, a silver lining to the pandemic, just how delicate our food systems are and how much we rely on massive transportation infrastructure and continued concentration of the meatpacking industry, for example, and just how susceptible things are to disturbances within that. And so I know that there are also a lot of amazing folks working on local food systems that are recognizing how much food comes from rural communities and yet how expensive food is in rural communities. And so I think there is great work that's happening, folks building cooperatives, cooperatives, whether growers cooperatives made of farmers or cooperatives for grocery stores to introduce more competition into their own supply chain in their communities. And to be able to look at the options for processing products that are grown at home in their home communities. So I know that there's a new mobile processing unit for meat that the Montana Farmers Union just started on the High Line in mid central Montana, North central Montana. And they're able to work with the local ranchers and they're able to process their meat and get it sold locally there. And it's USDA inspected. I know that the Blackfeet tribe is looking at building their own multi-species processing facility. We raise so many grass-fed beef and bison here and they have to be shipped off to be sold to other people. And then they get sold back to us at extremely high prices. There's definitely folks that are working on thinking of how to solve that. I think of the folks that started the Lentil Underground and Timeless Seeds in Montana, and they looked at why aren't we growing a legume that helps improve our soil health and that's drought resistant and makes more sense in our climate? Oh, it's because it doesn't have federal subsidies and you know it's not part of the things that are promoted by agricultural industries. It can be grown organically. And, you know, people think about how to escape some of these systems. And there's a lot of really beautiful, creative solutions that are happening and they have to happen. Our little community of 300 is talking about how we can start a farmer's market. There's not a lot of people that grow gardens around here, but there are people that are interested in growing gardens. We have Hutterite communities that grow vegetables around here. And we recognize that that's a great source of local food for us. We can get food that is grown on our reservation, that's grown, you know, by our Hutterite communities. And so we, there's a lot of work that occurs within all of this because we have to we have to change the way that our food systems are. We have to change the direction that things are going, or they they will collapse. Yeah immediately like there isn't any time to waste it feels like and I mean this like goes along with that I wondered what you have noticed in effects to climate change in your region in recent years you have grown up in that area and have lived you know most of your life there how has it changed besides besides being able to literally see glaciers <laughs> that are melting you can see the impacts of drought in this community. In the two years that we've lived here, the lake is, we have a beach that's probably about 50 feet longer than it was when we moved in because last year was a pretty bad drought year. I don't know if the snowfall will make up for much of that this year. That's a concern. There is also, of course, the warming temperatures of the waters. So not having enough snow melt that keeps our creeks very cold, which means that the waters are getting less clear in places, algae is able to thrive, which means that our trout populations are being harmed, especially our, our bull trout populations. So we look at some of that stuff, the impacts of drought on fire, and we've had some pretty crazy prairie fires that have sprung up. And I talked about the winds earlier when we get prairie fires, even in November, they take off and suddenly you have an emergency situation for anyone downwind. You can't stop a prairie fire very easily. Grass burns fast. And, you know, I remember a prairie fire in November that we had that evacuated a small housing community 
Luckily, it was diverted and no one was hurt. And two days later, we had a foot of snow on the ground. And it's just chaos. So we have to be ready for anything. We have some pretty extreme temperature swings that are occurring. So in Montana, our, our climate studies show us that we will continue to average the same amount of precipitation every year, but that precipitation will be concentrated more in the winter and less in the summer. So we're going to shift to hotter, drier summers and wetter, rainier winters. That's not great for our communities. because Rain is pretty much immediately distributed into the soil, whereas snowpack has potential to continue our moisture levels much farther into the summer. That said, there's always really, there's also really cool climate adaptation strategies that are taking place. Here on the Blackfeet Reservation, we have something called the Kutztucky Project, which is our beaver project. And they use beaver mimicry to essentially humans go in and create dams made of sticks and mud and use that to start these backflows of water to start these wetlands that are very similar to what beavers are creating. Beavers come in to these places and they're like, people don't know what they're doing and they'll fix the dam and you'll get beaver populations coming to these areas too. So we've had a ton of work restoring beaver populations, which in some places they'll back up culverts and (laughs) it'll flood the roadways. But in a large part, it will help replenish our aquifers, It will keep wetland areas that, of course, act as natural fire blockades. So there's a lot of really cool work happening there. There are tools to make us more resilient in the face of climate change. But we also know that our communities still have to rely on wood stoves, for example. We all need wood stoves as backup. And I was talking to my friend that is talking about climate action and how we do climate planning. And in rural communities, it looks very different than it looks in urban communities. We don't have a recycling center. We can lose power for days at a time when it's 40 below. And we have to have backups and we have to have ways of thinking through that. And they don't always look the same as they do for folks in urban communities. And so resiliency means different things in different communities, but there's definitely the ability to see firsthand the impact of climate change here and how we are navigating that and trying to create a system that will thrive even as those impacts take shape. I feel like that's an actionable thing that anybody can do right now who's feeling very scared about our changing climate is to look to local organizations where they are, or, you know, what organizations would you direct them to, to offer their skills, their time, or their resources? Protect Our Winters is a super good organization. And of course, that's kind of the community I'm coming from that's thinking about how how the changing climate impacts our snow and our waters and everything else. So pow, Uh, (laughs) but I also, I look at the ways in which, you know, we're trying to work on creating food systems and communities that make sense in our 21st century changing lives. And I mentioned that we're on the board of Fast Blackfeet, my partner and I both, and, you know, we run the local food pantry, but there's also programs that we're running that are basically designed to make the food pantry unnecessary in the future. We don't want a community that has to rely on this emergency food system. We want a community that's able to feed ourselves. And so part of that, for example, and this is for folks that are like, what what is this fast black feet? Um, (laughs) Because we realized that we wanted to give people healthy beverages through the food pantry. And so we started growing native plants that black feet people have traditionally used for teas We set pantry participants up with our native plants, with garden beds and starter plants, and taught them how to grow these plants and harvest them and dry them out. And we set up a weigh-in pay station so they can be paid for the amount of dried plants that they're bringing in. And those are now able to go out with the pantry distributions. The project is also, you know, my partner's organizing a bison harvest through 
our treaty rights, but actually to be able to take a small crew down to Yellowstone National Park, because when the bison leave the park, we have treaty rights through the Lame Bull Treaty to harvest them. And to be able to harvest a couple of bison and then distribute them through the food pantry is a really big opportunity to bring people healthy meat and also to exercise our treaty rights. So that's something super cool. And then we're trying to build a food resource center with a commercial kitchen where people will be able to come and process foods and have that in a safe and inspected facility and then eventually house the food pantry and then maybe eventually a co-op. We don't know, but we're, we're trying to build systems that can accompany the food pantry right now. And hopefully in the future, we'll, we'll make a difference in changing our food sovereignty of our community. I have no doubt that you will, Mariah. I just, I wonder like, how do you balance it all? How do you balance all of the work that you're doing? And how do you find time to like reconnect with yourself and to rejuvenate so that you can keep pushing forward? Because clearly you have a lot on your plate. I'm sure some of my projects are getting neglected right now. Um, <laughs> but that said, I, I, I think I try to be intentional about scheduling time that are just off days and we're going skiing and my phone's going to freeze in my pocket. And that's what it is. And, you know, I am trying to stay super intentional about moving and just getting out and doing things and then learning from folks, taking time to tune into other people's classes. And, you know, sometimes the downtime is chilling by the wood stove and watching Netflix. And I'm a stress baker. So I will make elaborate dessert. I'm not a stress eater. I'm just a stress baker, which means that other people will get a lot of food when I start stress baking, but it works. And it's, it's also nice to have a time that I'm like, I'm cooking, but this is not for work. And so to be able to have that space and then, you know, trying to read and listen to audiobooks and just stay tuned in. The pandemic itself has been really devastating on so many levels. And it sounds like your community has really rallied together, but I wondered you know, from your perspective, how your community has weathered and navigated through this difficult time? You know, Native communities and the Blackfeet community included have been hit pretty hard by the pandemic. And that said, we've also done a lot of work to recognize the importance of community health amidst all of this. We closed the eastern borders of Glacier National Park for the 2020 season which because all of the borders were on the reservation. So we just didn't let people come really. And so there was a lot of decisions that were made that uh, affected the ways in which we were able to create resilience within our community. You know, despite Montana lifting its mask mandate a while ago, we still have a mask mandate here on the reservation. We, you know, have even in our little community of 300, there's, flu shots and booster shots happening down at our volunteer fire department today. You know, there are things that are happening that are ways of showing we care about each other as a community. We will miss out on some in-person gatherings and, you know, have, have smaller scale everything just so that we're able to recognize how much we care. And though we have lost people, we have also continued to really recognize how important it is to, to stay safe and stay healthy in all of this. I could talk to you forever and we, <laughs> we have gone way over our time, but I wonder to close it out, just one last question. What exciting things are on the horizon for you from either a personal or a business perspective? And how can people kind of get involved, follow along, contribute, support your work? Exciting things happening. Let's see, I'm working on a toolkit with Montana No Kid Hungry to incorporate more Indigenous foods into school lunch programs. That's pretty exciting. We're in the early planning stages of a children's cookbook. Because I think there are there are native cookbooks out there. I don't think there's any native cookbooks just for kids. And as someone that learned how to cook as a kid, I think that's needed. So that's something we're working on. Of course, there are fun projects happening with the bison harvest, with hide tanning classes. We're just going to work on putting out more materials 
that are in food systems. So, you know, gardening lessons, polyculture planting, things like that. In addition to cooking videos, that's all super exciting. And then just trying to keep putting out new material for folks. So anyone can follow along really easily at Facebook at Indigikitchen, Instagram at Indigikitchen, YouTube at Indigikitchen, or just Indigikitchen.com. So all of those are really easy to find out what we're up to. And I'm excited about all the projects for sure. You give me real hope for the future speaking with you and keep doing the amazing work that you're doing. And thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom and your story with us. Cause I think that it really inspired me and I know people listening as well. Thank you again, Mariah, for joining us on the show. I honestly was a little starstruck when I spoke with Mariah and I don't get that way very often. And I just think that she is such an incredibly wise and powerful leader. And I see her doing amazing things currently and into the future. And some of my key takeaways from this episode are that there's tremendous value in fusing traditional wisdom with modern technical approaches to create the widest possible impact. Also, since the birth of colonialization, Food has been used as a tool to maintain power over groups of people. And the path towards reclaiming food sovereignty is vital for a more equitable future. We must prioritize building resilient local food systems. There are many ways to manifest impactful change in the world. And just starting with what you have can lead to something that you never expected. Taking action beats second guessing yourself. Another takeaway is the power of a well-connected small community that ensures the well-being of each individual. That power really cannot be understated. Community togetherness will be necessary for us to weather and survive the hardships that will inevitably be thrown our way in this uncertain future. Mariah's work exemplifies how indigenous practices and wisdom can build resilient and nurturing communities. I hope you've taken away a lot from this episode. I know I have. Hi, friends. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Urban Exodus podcast. This project is made possible by listener support. I do this work because the people I meet through this project give me hope for the future. And I think we could all use a little more motivation and inspiration in this current moment in history. All of the work that I do through this project is to encourage people to believe in themselves and to work towards a better future for their community and for our planet. Your continued support will keep this passion project running. The easiest way to contribute is to click the support button on the top of urbanexodus.com and pledge any amount that you like. Or you can buy an ad spot in an upcoming episode, shop our online store of rurally made goods, or join our Patreon community for access to bonus features, rapid fire interviews with podcast guests, videos, live presentations, and so much more. Visit patreon.com slash urban exodus. Another way to support is by giving us a five-star rating on iTunes and recommending Urban Exodus to your friends. Thank you again for helping me continue to do this work. I couldn't do this without all of you. You can find Urban Exodus on Instagram and Facebook at The Urban Exodus. To read more in-depth features on folks who ditched the city and went country, visit urbanexodus.com. Until next time, I'm Alyssa Hessler, and this is The Urban Exodus.